Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. Back in August of 2023, I took this trash found Magnavox Philips 13 inch television set here, and I decided to replace the guts of this, that is all the electronics, with what was in this box, which was a modern made in 2023 television replacement board that I got from AliExpress. The main thing about this board that was better than what was in this TV here, which was from the early 2000s, is that the aftermarket board from AliExpress it was actually multi-format, supporting NTSC, PAL, and CCAM. Meanwhile, this was a total domestic market set here for the United States, which means it only supports NTSC, and that's it. I was successful in that video in getting this board working in here, and it worked really well paired with the existing CRT and deflection yoke. The biggest problem with this conversion couldn't be fixed with me replacing the circuit board, and it's that this TV set is extremely ugly, with a very bulbous look to it that I actually totally hate. I realized that I was really never going to use this thing, so I actually extracted the board out of it, and then I had a thought. I have something better that I could put the innards of this into to make a much more useful, but also better looking monitor. And this Commodore 1702 sitting here on the bench probably gives away what my plans are. But this set, while it's cosmetically in really good shape, has a very worn out CRT, and at the minimum is gonna need a CRT transplant. But instead of just doing that, why don't we go all the way and put this multi-format board into this monitor and make one of the first multi-standard Commodore 1702 monitors out there in the world. So without further ado, let's get right to it. What makes the Commodore 1702 so perfect for projects like this is that inside of its chassis, and I already have this replacement CRT mounted in the set, there's so much space in here. Now here is that Chinese modern replacement board that I had in that other set. And as you can see, if we just move these wires out of the way, there is lots and lots of room inside of here to hold this. But even better is the original circuit board that was in here, which is right here, is all self-contained on this metal chassis here, which actually includes what protrudes through the front of the monitor, which is normally the controls for making the adjustments. Also the front video inputs, the power switch, the light, the power light, and on this rear board here, which is also mounted on here, are the rear video inputs. It's all self-contained on this board which means all I need to do is gut this of its original electronics and then mount this board onto here, get everything connected up to the various video inputs, the power switch, stuff like that. And then it should easily be able to just to slide into the case here and then have the monitor be reassembled and you'd be almost none the wiser that inside of this was now a multi-standard and somewhat modern video processing board with tuner. Now it goes without saying, if you have a 1702 with a bad CRT like this one had, and you find a donor TV set, a 13 inch set, there's a very good chance that the CRT is gonna be fully compatible and fit in the case, just like this one here made by Sheng Hua. And if you wanna reuse your 1702 analog board just to retain 100% stock functionality, you'll need to swap the yoke that came with the CRT and use the one that was originally on the CRT on the 1702. This old style board is completely tuned and adapted to use the particular yoke that was in use with this board. And the one from the modern TV sets probably not gonna work properly. You can try it, but I have a feeling you're gonna have geometry issues due to the inductance differences on these more modern yokes. I just wanted to point that out as a way to easily refresh one of these monitors. And I've actually done that before where I think actually it was with this CRT itself. I swapped the yoke over and I tested it out with the original electronics in this and it drove it perfectly. After a little bit of adjustment of the drive and the bias levels, the picture looked fantastic. These 1702 boards I found to be extremely reliable and generally if there's a problem with your monitor, it's probably due to a crack in this because the monitor was dropped. Meanwhile, as a refresher, the biggest difference with this newer board is that it's multi-standard. PAL, NTSC, and CCAM, and this board here in my left hand only supports NTSC here in North America, and if you're in PAL regions, it only supports PAL color. 
Here in North America, having a multi-standard CRT is completely uncommon. And for someone like me, who has a bunch of retro computers that come from overseas, having a monitor that will completely work with those systems is completely worth it. For those of you who are living in PAL regions, on the other hand, are probably used to having televisions from like the mid 2000s on that just support everything, not to mention you have SCART as well. So really this upgrade is really only appropriate for people here in North America. All right, I think it's time to start trying to figure out how to get this properly mounted into the chassis. I don't need to do any testing to see if this works with the CRT and yoke combination because this is the exact setup that I was using in the first video about this board. I think the first thing I need to do is just remove all the electronics from this board and I'm gonna keep these wires on here. These are the video cables that go from like the front connectors and this rear connector. I'll just need to desolder them from the original board here because I don't think on the new board, I'm gonna be reusing these video connectors that are on the back here since there's no holes in the back of the case anyways. I'm gonna probably just desolder this and then I'll be soldering on these wires instead so that we can retain the functionality of these connections. The original 1702 uses a little actual incandescent light bulb here for the power light. And I think it's actually connected to the output of the flyback that drives the heater on the CRT. So that if your monitor is powered on, but yet not quite generating any high voltage, you're not gonna have this power light working. The new electronics has a little receiver board for the infrared and also a little power LED. So I think I'm gonna desolder the power LED and I will mount a little green LED in this spot here so that it shines through the original spot. Now, besides the LED, we have to figure out where to mount the buttons and this little infrared receiver. Now, I was thinking if I wasn't gonna put a power LED, I could try to mount the infrared receiver inside the space where the light bulb goes so that the remote would actually work through that little window because there's no infrared window on this monitor. But after thinking about it, I'd rather have a working power LED and I'm gonna mount the infrared receiver and the buttons in the space where these original knobs went here. This little panel here clips on to the front of this. And when you open up the front door, you actually see this plastic here where these original three knobs were and a recessed potentiometer. I'm just gonna mount this right onto here like that, just using a little bit of hot glue. So when you flip down the door, that is visible. And then when it comes to the infrared receiver, I think I'm just gonna mount it somewhere in here so that when you flip down the door, the original holes where those original potentiometers went through, these ones, the receiver should be able to pick up the infrared signals from the remote through one of those holes. Now you don't need to use the remote for most functions because ultimately you can flip it down, you can switch inputs and things like that. And there will be a physical power switch right here. And with this particular monitor, when you apply AC power to it, it actually powers on the entire set and then you can just turn it off by using this as well. So the reality is, unless you're switching inputs or adjusting some of the settings, you won't need to use the remote for anything. Okay, so I think the first thing I need to do is just start taking apart this bit of spaghetti here, and uh, we'll see what we're working with once these boards are off. All right, everything is extricated. We have the original power cord, which I'm going to retain, and then we also have the power switch cables here. And then we have these wires here off this uh, rear connection panel, which also includes the front connectors because those actually connect up into this and there's a toggle switch here. So I'm probably gonna have to rewire some of this to make it all work with a new board, but shouldn't be too hard. And the good thing is these wires here are nice coax type cables that are shielded. So it should be good from a, for a signal integrity standpoint. All right, so when it comes to fitting this board on here, there's a few things that are causing problems. But one of the wild things is that Right now, the front of the PCB is actually mounted in this uh, slot right here, which holds it. And with it in there like that, that screw right there, that mounting screw lines up perfectly. Obviously though, this part of the board here is like hanging off the edge, so that's not gonna work. So I'm gonna need to remove these little plastic clips here so I can slide the board over. Then the problem is this is the power supply here and it's gonna be right over this solid metal part. So I think what I'm gonna need to do is bust out the Dremel and cut away this section of the metal along with this bar right here. If we take this out here, you can see there's a bar right here. I'm gonna need to remove this and I'm gonna have to remove this area here so that this can sit in here without having the metal right underneath the PCB. All right, check it out. I have it mounted in the chassis. I can't say it was exactly easy to remove this. I started to use the Dremel and this is actually pretty thick metal. So the Dremel was taking forever. So I went outside and I used the angle grinder actually to cut the majority of this out. I actually cut that part out with the Dremel and then I cut this part with the angle grinder. Once I had those metal parts removed, I test fit this in and there was like a tab here that I think was too close to some of the pins. So I cut that off and I trimmed a few other things. And well, as you can see, the board is in there. 
Now, unfortunately, I was only able to use one screw hole, and that's this one over here in the corner. I had originally had this screw hole used, but then I realized that, well, the metal was just way too close to these pins here, which is actually mains. I didn't want that. So I used the angle grinder to cut this away. So now, uh, well, there's no risk of that touching any longer because I wasn't able to retain that screw. The board could shift around theoretically a little bit in here, and I didn't want that to happen. So I put a bunch of hot glue all around so that it can't move around. But even if this corner did slide that way because it was pivoting on this screw, it still wouldn't be able to touch any of the mains pins to the chassis here. And that's because right here, there's a little elbow. And if the board slides that way, it actually hits right here to stop it from moving too far that direction. With the main board in there, I went ahead and I mounted the front controls. Now I could use two screws to hold this in there and there, but I decided just to use hot glue for now. If everything fits properly, when I put this all back together, then maybe I'll install a couple screws there and there just to make sure that this never goes anywhere. The wire from the front panel is routed right here and it goes into the correct connector on the board. And I went ahead and I hooked up the power switch and the mains cord. So the live or hot leg is this wire here and this goes into the switch. So we were switching on the hot side and it is a polarized plug and that comes out here and it goes into the hot connector on the motherboard. And I have actually soldered that on, put some heat shrink and that goes right into a fuse. And then this wire here, which is neutral, I extended the wire and I ran it to the board in the appropriate spot. And in case you're wondering what this is, these two capacitors here that are floating above the board, this is a voltage doubler to allow this 220 volt power supply here, switch mode power supply, to work on 120 volts. To do this little mod, it is very similar to what happens inside switch mode power supplies like for the Apple II and the BBC Micro to operate 120 volts. You take the main capacitor out of the board and then you wire two up in series, and then you connect it back into the board, and then you run a wire from this side of the bridge rectifier. You see that little diode right there? That red wire runs in between to the middle of these two capacitors, and that actually makes a voltage doubler so that this power supply sees the same voltage it did when it was running on 220 volts. Now, the reason why these are floating is because there wasn't room to mount two of these on the PCB. And I had to lay them over on their side like this because the CRT is right here. You just don't have a lot of clearance. So I have a little bit of a standoff right there, a bunch of hot glue. And well, I mean, even though it wobbles around, it's still totally fine. All right, next up is the infrared receiver. So I'm going to remove the LED as I talked about. I'm going to move it into here. I'm going to put a green one instead of a, a red one. And then I'm going to hot glue this underneath here somehow like that so that the remote control will work through the original holes that were there for the potentiometer. Alrighty, the green LED is there. This uh, blue and white wire goes to that from this little PCB, which is in the correct spot. Now, I think I'm actually ready to pop this into the monitor and see if this actually works properly still. I don't have any of the video cables hooked up. Once we know this is working, then I'll start to reverse engineer how this works so we can get the connections all hooked up. I love this monitor for the fact that it's so easy to work on. To get this in and out, it just slides in on rails. I mean, how much easier can you get than this monitor? So I just wanna make sure these wires here for the front little LED thing aren't interfering. I think it slid forward most of the way. Let's turn this around and just see what we see here. Okay, so I think one of the issues is the little front control board here the wire runs up and over, and I think I'm gonna to have to put a little bit of a notch in the plastic right here, just to allow that to go. Cause I don't think the board is sliding in all the way because of that. But the power switch is here, front video inputs, and then there are the holes there that we're gonna hopefully get the little remote control IR receiver to show through. Okay, for notching this, I'm just gonna push it back slightly, and I'm gonna use a Sharpie here, just to mark the plastic exactly where I need to notch it. Plastic is notched, so that should fit in there properly. And then I have an idea of how to figure out where to position the IR receiver. I'm just gonna take this out, I'm gonna slide this in, and then I'm gonna stick a marker through one of the holes to mark right here. And that'll give me an indication of exactly where I need to hot glue this so that the IR receiver lines up with one of the holes. I'm gonna use this one right here, and the Sharpie just happens to fit perfectly in there, and we'll just circle it around so it marks where the receiver needs to go, which is right there, easy peasy. While this is out again, let's plug in one of these speaker connections. So, and I think at this point, we're actually ready for some testing. So let's plug everything in. Now this monitor hasn't been turned on in forever, so uh, there's no high voltage in any of this stuff, like not in the CRT here, 
But as per usual, never, and I repeat, never work on a CRT unless you know how to do it safely. I'll hook up the ground lead for the CRT. Do need to slide this out just a little bit so I can hook up the deflection yoke here. I'm not gonna bother dressing all the cables right now. I'll do that when we are further along and we know everything works. Here is the top panel that has the speaker in it. So let's connect this up. And yeah, it was a little bit of a doofus. I hooked that up with the wire running through here and that's not gonna work. <laughs> let's pull this out and reconnect this again. That is easier than unplugging everything else. So I should be able to slide this top panel into the monitor while it's disassembled. Yep, just like that. And the 1702 has a degaussing coil, which is this wire right here. And I'm gonna plug this in. Now this may not work. And the reason why is this board uses a thermistor to fire the degausser and then it kind of fades over time over like the period of about a second. And the problem is the thermistor that's on here, I think is designed for 220 volts and the resistance of the coil, at least on that Magnavox monitor was such that you always got this kind of wavy picture while it was connected. If that happens on here, I'm gonna have to try to swap that thermistor out with one that's compatible with 120 volts. But the other hand is the coil that's on this monitor might be a different impedance than the one on the Philips monitor, and it might be enough to trigger this thermistor basically to make the resistance very high, which stops the current flowing to the degaussing coil. We'll be able to see it pretty quickly once we power on the monitor. Everything should be ready to go. Let's slide this in. Uh, I don't know if this uh, speaker cable is actually gonna reach. Oh, it just does reach. Okay, that's very cool. Okay, so let's just double check everything. So high voltage is connected. Let's uh, turn this so it's away from the speaker. Just sort of right there is fine. Neck board's connected. The ground lead is connected that goes from the DAG here to the neck board. Here's the power supply cable, which is all ready to go. Let's just make sure it is off. It is currently in the off position. And then this board here is not connected to anything right now. It goes to the front inputs, but that's it. It doesn't actually connect up to this board at all. For testing though, we can plug a video signal into this rear jack here, and we can plug an RF signal in here and see if things are working. Now that entire slide in and out chassis has three screws that go in the front here. That's what holds it in place. It's nothing on the back, it's completely on the front. And when we have the front door installed in this monitor, it will cover all of this. So the monitor will look completely OEM, except for the fact that this CRT has a bit of a darker phosphor to it. And here we go, let's turn this on. See what happens. Nothing. Now, part of the reason why is there's a setting to allow this thing to turn on with the mains or remember its last state. And I'm gonna try turning this on with the power switch here. Okay, there we go. All right, so the LED I installed in there clearly is either hooked up backwards <laughs> or it's not working. Okay, well anyways, there it is. We saw the blue screen for a second. Now we have this bouncing, um, whatever, screensaver, so to speak. And I definitely can see that the LED that's in there is glowing. So it's not like I have the polarity wrong, but it is not in the right position or it's too dim to actually show anything. And just like that, I have the test pattern generator connected up. Now I'm noticing that the picture looks a little bit too wide. Notice you can barely see anything of these color bars on the side here. Now right here where I have my finger, this red wire here goes to the deflection yoke and there are multiple pins there to connect up to and moving this to the other pins will affect the width of the picture. I had it on the middle pin, which is just sort of like the default setting. Let's try these other pins. I'm gonna start with this one on the outside first. All right, power it on. Gonna have to figure out how to get this LED working. Okay, it's even wider now. So <laughs> that's not the right setting. All right, it's on the pin on the far side. Let's power this back up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Clearly uh, it's too narrow now. <laughs> okay, I just plugged it into another one of them. Let's see if this is a little bit better. All right, it is definitely looking a bit better, but yeah, we still have a little bit of bars on the side. So I'm gonna try the one and final one. Hopefully it's the perfect middle ground uh, to get this the right width. In the service menu using the remote, there are no controls for width. You can only do it by moving those pins around or by swapping some components on the board. Okay, I just put it on the final setting. The pins that I'm plugging into are gonna vary depending on the deflection yoke. And yeah, there we go, that looks good now. So we can definitely see more of this. But the first thing we need to do is go into the service mode and do a setup for the drives and the bias controls. So if you buy one of these, the service mode button is this one right here above the zero and eight. There's just a little hole there. You gotta poke it with something just once and it will say factory. 
So there we go, I pushed it. Now it says factory. You push the display button and you push it twice. And now we're at F0. And to access all of the controls that are in here, what you have to do is push the mute button until you get to page. And we change this to page one. And now we have access to about, I think 18 screens of things that you can control. But the first thing we're gonna do is go to F0 and I'm get to that by pushing the zero key on here. And I'm gonna push the mute key so we can adjust the drives and the bias controls. So right now it is actually shrunk down to a single line, but also dim the image. And you notice we're not really seeing anything right now. So I'm gonna input a white signal, which is what's being input right now, but notice we're still seeing nothing. So I need to go on the flyback transformer and turn up the screen control until we see a line, which we do right now. Now, ultimately you should wait until the system has warmed up fully, but I think uh, we're probably good to go with this. Now, what we wanna do is we wanna get this line to be gray. And currently it's kind of a greeny cyan color. And that indicates to me that the red bias is too low. Now we can adjust the bias controls RGB by using one and four and two and five and three and six. So watch this. So if I start turning up the red. Now this looks a lot more white to me than it did before. Now, I don't think you'll be able to see this in the camera probably, but originally it had a very cyan tint to it. And now it actually looks nice and gray. Oh, I just had a thought though. I should probably go into the menu here and change the color temperature to standard. I'm not sure that even matters when we're in the factory mode, but just in case it does, let's go back to the line and all of it looks good. So if I turn down the red bias, then this line is gonna be this cyan color, which is what it was a little while ago. So I'm turning it back up. I could also turn down the blue and the green as well. That's obviously a way you could do it as well, but you're just trying to get this looking gray and no longer that pink color. And yeah, that's good. I'd say that looks a nice gray right now. Okay, so if we exit out of that, so what we were adjusting was this one here, red cut. Now green cut is the two and five and blue cut would be, uh, what is it, three and six. Now you could adjust them in the menu here and go back and forth. It's just easier to do it when you're looking at that one line, just so you can get it all adjusted correctly. Now we also have a green drive and a blue drive, and I must have set those at some point. I don't think these are the default values, but going back to the color bars, yeah, things look decent. Now, one thing I'm also noticing is that with the brightness set to 50, so we're back at that middle setting, the picture is almost a bit too bright. And we can tell this because these bars down here, which hopefully are showing up, are clearly visible and they shouldn't be. Now this happened because I adjusted that screen to turn that up so I could do that service mode adjustment. I'm gonna leave the screen set the way it is now. And I'm gonna find the right setting in here so that I can, let's see, this is contrast. Here it is, brightness. So these three controls, the C1 is what, 50 the center of the brightness control is, and then the low value is this, and the high value is this. So if we go here and I turn this down, this actually affects, because it's currently set to the middle setting with brightness, that changes the overall brightness of the image. And I wanna just adjust it where I can only just start to see this line right here. It's underneath the numbers, but I can just see it right there. And I'm gonna make it, looks like maybe 65 is good, 64. And you can do the same for color. So right here, if I think the color is too saturated, I can turn that up or down. You can do it for tint as well. So this is the low part of tint. And I think the next one, oh, wrong way. There it is, there's the center control for tint. And you can move that up and down so you can get the tint dialed in just so you think it's right. Now tint, of course, is an NTSC thing. It's not on PAL, but it adjusts the hue of the entire image. Ultimately, to get the tint set up correctly on NTSC, what you do is you use a blue filter, like a gel here. I'll put this over the camera and I'll put that over the camera and you wanna get this adjusted, the tint, where these boxes on the color bars have the exact same intensity as these boxes. So these are complementary colors, cyan and purple, cyan and purple, for instance, and adjusting the tint we'll change that. So watch when I move this, I'm looking in the camera. See how this box is now brighter than that box and this one is darker than that? You wanna get this just so they are as similar as possible. And I'm doing this looking at the camera screen, so it's not super easy, but that looks pretty good. It's never gonna be exactly right because of the way the demodulation happens, plus adjusting like the red, green, blue drives and bias alters the overall color of the image. 
but generally that's a good way just to kind of get your tint set up correctly. Not to mention, I'm just used to how this looks now with these colors and that looks really good. Okay, so if we look through this stuff, I don't know what everything does, like these ones down here. I'm not exactly sure what these do. This has something to do with C-cam mode, I think. That's the S stuff. So that won't really do anything for us here. And I think these two controls have something to do with the black level on the component, the YUV input. Now there's a phase control, which moves the picture left and right. So we just kind of want to center that. We have a size control. Now I remember about this particular yoke, I have to keep this at the minimum setting here just to have an image that's not too tall. Because you can see when it goes the other way, the image is very stretched now. And that's just a side effect of using a yoke that's not perfectly tuned to the board that's in here. Uh, there is a vertical position, so you can move the entire image up or down. But I'm noticing here, now there's some retrace lines there. That has a strange effect of not actually moving the image, just sort of, I don't know what that does exactly. We have two controls here for linearity which if you put in a pattern like this, you wanna adjust these so that these boxes are the same size everywhere. Now I'm noticing these bottom ones are taller than the ones on the top. So one of these will adjust that. Let's see which one it is. Okay, it's this one. Okay, yep, it stretches the top. So this one, VLIN, stretches these top ones and shrinks the bottom ones here. So we're gonna just try to get everything, you know, eyeball it. You could use a ruler if you want but you just wanna eyeball it so everything looks as correct as possible. And then this one, VSC, kind of stretches or shrinks just the top and the bottom. So if these squares are bigger than the ones at the top and bottom, once you've balanced it, then you see what's happening here when I'm changing this, is it's shrinking the top and the bottom, but these middle boxes aren't really changing in size that much. And that actually looks a little bit better, but it seems to take out some of the size adjustment. Look how these ones don't make any change now. These two settings here are like a bow control. So if we change this one, what it's doing is it's, it's kind of wrapping the top and the bottom back and forth. So you just wanna do it so the lines are straight. Usually I found, well, seven is the best setting there is. And then this one here, I think tilts the entire image this way. So again, you just wanna get it where like the line is lined up on the side of the screen as good as possible. That looks pretty good. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting is if you push the sleep button, then you actually have some test pattern. So now it has a PAL, black screen, white screen, cross. Uh, we got this, convergence, and then NTSC, similar. We got these two patterns as well. And then it goes back to what you were looking at. All right, it's actually about centered, but now I can just see the bottom scan line there and there. So I need to make the whole thing taller. So it's cool, actually. I think the linearity controls shrunk the image down a little bit. So even though I said originally, it was too big on this thing, it actually is not. So yeah, there we go, that looks good now. All right, well, that was a lot of adjustment, but this thing is looking good. I think the next thing is I need to figure out how to hook up this video input circuitry here and these front inputs and stop using that input on the back of the set. All right, as you can see, I've removed the chassis from the monitor, which is again, why I just love the 1702 because it's so easy to get this whole thing in and out without any fuss. The first thing we need to look at is how this panel here works. So we gotta check the schematics for the 1702, and then we're gonna have to dig into the schematics a little bit for this board, just to see how we might be able to connect this thing up. Here's the service manual for the 1702, and this is that little AV terminal that's on the back of the monitor. This is that toggle switch that's on the AV panel that switches between the front and the rear input. And when it's set to rear, it also actually uses the Chroma Luma input while the front is only composite video. When we look at the Luma input that's on the rear panel and we look at the video input, the composite video on the front panel, you can see that they actually both go to the same part of the switch and the switch just toggles between them. And that actually works because in the monitor, when you're inputting a composite video signal, what's actually happening is there's an IC, which I think is this one over here, video and sync separator, which separates the chroma and the luma signal from the composite video. And what happens is it actually routes that chroma signal out and into that rear switch panel. And when you flip that switch, you're actually switching between that separated chroma signal that comes from inside the monitor to the external chroma input on the back. That's these three wires up here. And the lower part of the switch is actually switching this transistor right here, which you can see it says Y slash or YGR switcher. And it sends, I think, either five volts or ground to that. 
I think that facilitates the whole S-Video, Chroma Luma, or composite video switching. Interesting as well is that while this actually has the capability of switching the audio input between the front audio jack and the back audio jack, they actually don't have it wired up that way. So you can see the audio input on the back goes into that pin, and the audio input on the front also goes into that pin or and that pin. They're basically bridged together. And when we look here, there's a jumper link right there that's actually that bridge that's happening. I'm not 100% sure why they did it that way. So just know if you plug something into the audio input on the back or the front, they're actually the same. They're bridged together. Now, in the same vein of these two things being jumpered together, I actually like to do that same mod on all my 17-inch monitors for the front and the rear video input. For me personally, I'd like to be able to plug a composite video input into the back of the monitor or the front of the monitor and have both of them work irrespective of the switch position. And the only thing that switch position actually does is enable or disable that chroma input. Now, when it comes to this Chinese board that we're going to be using in here, it works a little bit differently than it does on the Commodore. And everything is happening inside this jungle IC when it comes to the chroma processing. There's an extra pin on here that's not used right now that takes the color or the chroma input and I think all we need to do is run this chroma signal that's on this board to that pin on the jungle chip, and we have to install a couple passive components to make that happen. What we're looking at here is a translated version of the data sheet, which seems to only be in Chinese for the jungle IC that's on this board. And if we take a look at these pins over here, so here's a YCRCB input, so that's component video. We're not gonna worry about that right now. And then we have video one or Y input on pin 24, and then we also have another video one input on pin 26. Now this input here, pin 26, happens to be used for the TV tuner that's on this board. And you'll see here on pin 30, that's the output of the TV tuner part of the jungle chip. It basically converts the RF signals into a video signal. It comes out and then it goes back in. So in this case, we can't use pin 26. We're gonna have to use pin 24 for the Y input, but luckily it's also the composite video input. It does both. Now, pin 23 right above it says C input, and that's the color or chroma information for the YC mode. And looking further down, pin 23, C in, chroma and signal input. If this level of the pin is not zero, so not ground, it will automatically recognize the S input. And then pin 24, it says S in, which is AV input terminal. Now, the terminology on this doesn't really make a lot of sense, but I'm pretty sure that the way this is configured now, pin 24 is actually the composite video input on this board. And looking at the scan of the schematic for this particular board we're using, there it is, pin 24, AV1, Y in. And if we scroll over here, looks like it goes through a cap and a resistor and another resistor. So this is the termination and there it is, video input. And looking at, and over here, pin 23, it says AV2, Y input and it says it or shows it as not connected to anything. Back on the data sheet for the jungle I see, it says 23 pin. So that's that chroma pin, right? Is this chrominant signal input or CBBS or composite input? So it actually looks like that chroma input can be used as a second audio video input, depending on the setting of this, which is actually in the factory service menu. Zero for chroma signal or one for CBBS. Now, the funny thing about this particular board and the schematics that were included with it is that these schematics are just a general guideline as to way this is actually connected. It seems that there's a bunch of stuff on here that is not represented on the schematic. Now, this is sort of a funny thing about this board is that there are obvious things happening on the board here which are not represented on the schematics. And notice all these unpopulated components right here. The pin 23, which is that second video input or the chroma input, actually makes its way over to these passive components along with a second audio input, and it makes its way to this header. And all of this stuff was unpopulated on this board. Originally, there was a header installed here. I've gone ahead and removed it. This is for the second AV input that came with this board. It was like a little circuit board with a couple RCA jacks on it. The connections here are just in parallel with these connections right here. Meaning if you connect a video audio source to that the little front PCB or you connect it to these, it's exactly the same thing. It shows up as input one on the jungle IC. But it seems like they had totally intended you to be able to plug that actual front little PCB into this connector and have these populated components that would then route those audio video signals into the chip and allow you to have a full two AV inputs. Now, what that means for us is we want to use that second input on pin 23 for the chrominance input, right? From that rear panel on the 1702 monitor. And ideally, you don't want to just connect up a video signal, whether it be a chrominance or a luminance one directly to the jungle IC, not without a capacitor and a divider network for termination of the signal. And we know that pin 23 is the chrominance signal that we want to input into here 
So what we're gonna have to do is just populate the components that go to that pin 23 over here and then connect the chrominance wire up into this second AV input connector. In addition, the reason why I removed this little header here that went to that little front PCB is because we're not gonna be using that because we're using this panel right here and the front inputs that are already on this chassis and we wanna route those into the monitor. So I went ahead and I removed the little plastic shells that were on the connectors that went onto the 1702 monitor so we can actually just connect this straight into the board here which will route the composite video or the Luma jack here and the audio right into the AV inputs on this. And then one of these, I don't remember which, is the chroma signal. And we're gonna be connecting it up to this side right here along with these passive components. And we should then have a working chroma input, hopefully. It's totally untested that this thing actually supports chroma Luma, but the fact is I see it in the data sheet and there seems to be stuff in the factory service menu for it. So I think we should get this working. Now, looking at this schematic again, there's pin 23. Notice it has nothing connected to it. And even that is not correct. Even though we're missing these passive components here, there is actually this resistor right here, which I have also desoldered. So it's just sitting in there. I think it's 10K and it pulls that pin down to ground. Because remember when we looked in the data sheet, it says when that pin is set to ground, it sees it as a second video input and not as S-Video or Chroma Luma. So what we need to do is pull this resistor out, which we just did right there, so it's no longer tied to ground. And now the next step is to find the passive components to fill in the appropriate set of two resistors and cap here, and then we should be good to go. Jump cut time. Okay, so everything has been connected up, and I think we're ready for some testing once this thing goes back into a monitor. I am realizing though that this uh, normally mounts on this bracket right here, and the bracket goes right there, and this will not reach because of this chroma signal. So I'm gonna to have to find something to extend this cable here and maybe even the other two signals as well. So this is the chroma. And if we take a look here, it goes into where the video signal and the ground goes on this connector, that's an AV2 connector. I've gone ahead and installed this capacitor here, one microfarad at 50 volts. This one here was one microfarad. This is the composite video that comes off this uh, built-in connector. One microfarad at 68 volts, figure that's good enough. So one at 50 volts should be fine. And then the termination resistors here, the two resistors on the video signal are 75 ohm and 75 ohm. I have a whole pack of those, I can't find them. <laughs> so I use 200 ohm resistors. I went and looked through all my resistors here and I just can't find the 75 ohms. If I do, I'll swap those out so they are the correct termination, but I think this should be good enough for testing. Obviously up here on the pin 23, I took that resistor out, which is labeled R153. That's that 10K pull up we have to remove. And then what we have here is this is the video signal cable that comes from the little back panel. And then this is the audio. Now, originally on the Commodore, it had four pins. There were two ground pins and then audio and video. Well, this is only a three pin connector that's there. So I added this extra ground pin right there into the motherboard. Those are all ground connections. Oh, I just realized I have the board upside down here. Uh, this is the audio here with the jumper link that connects those two pins together. This is the video for the front and the rear. I'm just gonna put a jumper link between these two pins. So we don't have to worry about the switch setting, front or back. And this is the exact same mod you could do on a real 1702, and I do it on all of mine, just so you can have composite video going into the back of the monitor, or to be honest, a Luma signal on the front of the monitor. Chassis is back in. I have it hooked up to the test pattern generator with the Chroma Luma. I'm just hooked up to the back panel, which is sitting on the table there. I also hooked up the audio, so if there's any sound that's working, we'll hear that. It's playing some royalty-free music. And let's power it up. Power LED is showing. Okay, there's the tuner. Sorry for the flicker. Let's switch the input. All right. So we are seeing a monochrome signal and obviously the audio is working, so I can just turn that down. So we're seeing a monochrome signal, and that makes sense because uh, it said AV1, so this should be just composite video, but we're currently only looking at a Luma signal because that's what's coming out of the test banner generator. And hopefully when I push AV1 again, we should see a color image, which should be fed through the S-Video or the Chroma Luma. Oh yes, all right, we got color. And do we have sound still? Yes, we do. <laughs> It looks freaking good. Let's uh, switch this. Oh, yes. Let's get closer here. Hopefully the camera doesn't have focus issues. If you're looking at this through composite, you'll get color, obviously. 
But this area up here will have, will just be kind of gray. And that's because up here, these lines are high enough frequency that if you don't filter them off, then the TV will interpret those as color. And uh, that's really the way the composite video works. It's a frequency that's overlaid on top of the Luma signal. And with S-Video, you get the full resolution of that because, well, the color information is contained separately. So you don't have to worry about information or patterns being converted into color. So let's switch this back to composite and I'm gonna go, let's see, oh, there was the tuner. Okay, so everything looks really sharp at the top. And there it is, I just reconnected the composite video signal and you should very clearly be able to see here that we've lost that information up here. It's just sort of like a solid gray. Everything up here looks totally fine and the color still looks really good, but we lost a lot of that sharpness. And that's exactly why using Chroma Luma or S-Video is a really good thing. It just produces a much sharper image because that filtering is disabled. Now, if I switch the input over here to the S-Video input, there it is. We're going to see, well, there's like a slight amount of color in it, but we do have sharpness up here now, but we also have this dot pattern that's all over this. And we'll see it much worse if I switch back to the color bars. Yeah, look at all the dots there. That is the actual color information that on the composite inf in input is being filtered away. Now, even though I have the chroma signal disconnected right now, it's not unusual that a little bit of color information does leak through, and that's happening inside that jungle I see. And it's actually my recollection that at least on the 1084 monitors from Commodore, if you plug a composite video signal like this into the Luma input on the back of the set and you switch it to Luma Chroma, you'll get a little bit of color information leaking through on those as well. Now, I think what I want to do here is I want to go through the service menu so that I can show everyone what settings I'm using on this particular board. So if you ever want to try to replicate this, you could copy the settings uh, that I have here to make it work as it's working here. Okay, so let's look through the specific relevant settings. So you need to have AV2 set to 1, and you need to have SVH set to 1. These two should be set to 0. Then you need to have 23 pins set set to 0 right here. That enables the chroma input on that pin 23. And then I have S audio set to one, D audio set to zero, and audio in set to zero. This combination I think is what's giving us audio on both of the inputs. And I think what happens if you fiddle with these, you'll only have audio on either the S video or the composite video. And you can actually hook up a second audio source to another pin that's not used on this jungle IC to input an audio signal. That would normally be the AV2 audio signal. On this particular monitor, there's no real reason to use that second audio input because there's only one audio jack on this entire set. So yeah, there we go. Now, the one thing I haven't figured out is how to disable the tuner. And there's a tuner thing down here. And I wonder if this is something, oh, there's a various settings here. So I'm not quite sure that actually disables it. I'm wondering if to disable the tuner, you just have to desolder it from the board entirely. And maybe if the jungle chip can't talk to it any longer, I think it talks to it over I squared C or some kind of like serial communication bus, then maybe it won't show up anymore. And then you can just truly have a video only monitor. Speaking of the tuner though, I actually want to retain the tuner in this thing because I think that's kind of a useful thing to have, especially if you're plugging in something like an Atari or something that doesn't generally have a composite video input. I was looking at the back of this and I noticed that the tuner sticks out just about as far as this power cable grommet kind of strain relief thing here. And when I look at it this way, the actual jack here is around the top edge of this power connector grommet thing. And I mentioned that because on the back of this set, there's this recess right here, which is on the higher end of where the power connector comes out. And I'm wondering if this actually is in line with the RF connector on here. So all I need to do is figure out where it lines up and then drill a hole there. And then I can actually utilize this push on RF connector that's on this European style tuner. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna try to reinstall this back cover. And I know it's gonna be hard to see, but I can see through the vent that's right here and I can see the RF jack is not hitting the back cover at all right now. But it does look like it is mostly lined up with this indentation. So if I drill a hole in this, especially kind of on the upper left corner, I think that means I can actually plug things into this tuner and, well, you know, properly use the tuner in this set. Originally, it was my thought that if this little indentation wasn't there and there was a good little bit of a gap, I could get a little right angle type RF connector and run a cable up and over to the little back panel where the chroma luma jacks are. But it actually totally appears that that is not necessary and I'm just going to get the drill out. I'm just going to put a hole right there. So I have a cable here. This came from one of my microcomputers I got from the UK. 
And look at that, plugs right in now. <laughs> so we actually have an RF connection into the tuner in this thing, and it doesn't look too bad. It's kind of just hidden away in there, and no one would be the wiser, to be honest, when you're looking at the back of this monitor. Okay, so the last thing stopping me from reassembling this monitor once and for all is I cannot get this back panel mounted. This is the bracket it goes onto. That screw needs to go right there. And it doesn't because these connections are too short. I think originally these video connections went in somewhere around here on the original board. Yeah, that's not gonna work. So I'm gonna have to find some new coax and extend this stuff. And there we go. I've extended the coax wires. So this thing is mounted in the correct location now. And I think this thing should be all ready to put the back cover on and button it up. And there we have it. This thing is back together. And I must say, I am really, really happy with how this thing turned out. When you're looking at the outside of the monitor, really nothing looks out of the ordinary. The back panel doesn't even have any labels on it. Everything is pretty standard. Only very eagle-eyed people will notice that there's actually an RF jack hiding in there. And only when you're looking at the front of the monitor and you flip down the door, will anything look slightly out of the ordinary. I did put a label there to help me with the buttons on the front. And I have a little indicator here to tell me where the IR sensor is. It's right behind the old brightness knob. Now let's take a look at this monitor compared to its unmodified brother. Eagle-eyed viewers are gonna notice there's actually another difference between these two monitors. And it's the color of the phosphor on the CRT. The CRT on the left came out of one of those Philips Magnavox 13-inch TVs, and it uses a slightly more modern, darker phosphor than this older one. I really do prefer the darker phosphor on this one because when there's a lot of ambient light, it just makes it a lot easier to see. Now, I went through this whole exercise for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted to revive this monitor to make it work well again, but also I really wanted to have a multi-format monitor that works with all the input signals. Let's turn this thing on. Let's take a look at how it looks hooked up to an Apple II. Now, since I haven't demonstrated that this does in fact work, we'll plug into the front video inputs and we'll switch this over to AV1 and power this up. There it is, Apple IIc. Oh, I gotta remake this disc here. It is having issues. There it is, Fat City, and it's looking freaking fantastic. Excellent, absolutely excellent. Now, as per usual with the Apple II, there's a little bit of color fringing around text, and that is completely normal. But what's kind of cool about this set is we can switch this over to the S-Video input, which means just pushing the AV input button once, and now the color fringing has gone away. Now, I reboot the machine here in S-Video mode. What's interesting is while in S-Video mode, some of the color information is leaking through, so you can see that there. I did create a picture profile that if I cycle through here, there we go. It's a black and white picture profile. And now all you see are those nice Apple II lines, pretty sharp, as sharp as this CRT can actually render. And there we are back on the text and it looks absolutely razor sharp. Well, as sharp as you can get with this low res CRT. Now there's something very cool about this CRT driver board, which I think makes it really well suited to Apple II computers. Pretty much every consumer composite monitor I've ever run into applies a notch filter to the incoming video signal to filter out the chroma noise that is just there on color composite video signals. This monitor does that while there's a color signal coming into it, but while it has a monochrome signal coming into it, it disables that filter. So you get razor sharp text, basically as sharp as you would get, just plug it into the Luma input of the Luma chroma input, and that is while you have it set to composite. That means on the Apple II, if you have text mode enabled, you get super sharp text, but when you have graphics enabled, you get proper color decoding. The only thing that lets this thing down for displaying really sharp 80 column text is the fact that the CRT that I'm using is actually just relatively low resolution. It has a pretty high dot pitch, probably 0.48 or 0.50 millimeters. I actually have a spare CRT that has a low dot pitch, so it's a high resolution, it can resolve a lot of detail, and it fits just perfectly inside this case. The problem is I don't have a yoke, a deflection yoke that is compatible with this board, so I can't use it. The yoke and CRT combo worked well enough that I could see really sharp, beautiful text and I know it was working well, but the problem is there was a lot of bowing on the image on both sides from like some kind of a mismatch in that yoke. So I couldn't end up using it, which is why we're using this combination that I know works. 
All right, it's time to bust out a Commodore 64 with the original Chroma Luma cable for this monitor and this computer. Let's see how it looks. All right, if we turn this on, we should get an image. Oh, it looks really dark and weird. Switching over to S video, we actually get a color image, but it's weirdly dark. Over composite video, it looks totally fine. If anything, it's a little bit dim, but this particular machine actually has an RF modulator with some potentiometers and I may not have the levels adjusted quite right. And back on S video with the Chroma Luma connected and yeah, it just looks really, really dim. Up until this point, I've done all my testing with the S video on this with my test pattern generator over its S video output to the Chroma Luma input on this and everything was spot on, it looked perfect. So I'm just wondering if something's going on with my Ziff 64 here. Let's try another 64. I have the field found 64 here. Let's just see how this thing looks with the same exact cables and power supply. All right, how's this look? Oh, it looks better. Let's check out 8-Bit Dance Party and see how it looks. It looks fine. It's still a little bit dim, but we have working sound. It's nice to see that this machine is working well as well. I think I made that video about this thing years ago, the Field Found 64, and look at that, it's still a survivor. I have not opened it up since I made that video, and it just still freaking works perfectly. And I've always found that the video output on the 64 always looks a little bit dim compared to, say, the Apple II, which we were just looking at, and that was super bright. That's actually one of the nice things about this particular set is I can create those picture profiles and we can, for instance, turn up the contrast here so that we get a nicer, brighter image. And I actually like to also kind of turn up the color saturation when using a 64. I just feel that the colors are kind of muted and just turning it up makes it look a little bit more vibrant. So I'm just gonna edit this vivid picture profile here. So it's 78 for contrast and 65 for the color. And that means anytime I wanna access it easily, I can just use the button here to switch over to Vivid. And now we're gonna get a nice bright image, at least on this Commodore 64. But I can go grab a PAL 64, like this 64G here, and it's just going to work and in color. Something that I've never been able to do, at least with any of my Commodore monitors. The only other monitor that I had that worked well in this situation, hopefully this computer works, there it is, it's freaking working. The shutter speed has been fixed and yeah, there it is, color pal, it looks amazing. And we should see it working and it looks so sharp and really, really good. Let me just show you how good that looks. That looks perfect. And this is our actual real pal Commodore 64 we're looking at. Now there's a little bit of give and take with this chassis now because the original monitor had a knob to move the picture left and right. And now I have to go into the service menu to do it. Luckily it has a separate setting. You adjust this H phase here so I can move that more centered again. So 20 seems like a good setting, but that is not as easy as it was with that knob that I could simply adjust. But on the other hand, most of what this monitor can do with this new board on it, the original 1702 could do already. The 1702 in its stock form is a wonderful monitor, but this right here, this PAL mode, this is what we're talking about. And this is exactly what I have wanted out of a monitor like this for so long. And I finally have it. And that is super exciting. And actually, now that I think about it, let's plug this RF cable in and see how this 64 looks on this over RF, something else. I never used to be able to do because I never had any kind of a television that had a tuner that was capable of working with machines like this one. Out with the Chroma Luma cable, in with the RF cable, and I'm just gonna plug this RCA jack right here into the output of the RF modulator. Now it's funny here, I switched over to the tuner and we're looking at like a television show and that's because I have a little uh, UHF transmitter set up and this is receiving that, even though it's plugged into the <laughs> Commodore 64 here, that's pretty hilarious. Okay, so we're on channel position one, doesn't really mean anything. And I'm gonna go to search here, and this should auto search for whatever signal this machine is outputting, and it's currently turned on. And hopefully it'll go through all the bands here and it should be able to find whatever this machine is doing. All right, it's found something, it's on UHF. If I go to MFT, I could do manual tuning. I don't know why there's no color. It's set to NTSC three, that's why we have no color. And we can set it to auto which did bring in the color, although it's kind of washed out looking. So let's do manual tuning here. See if we can tune this a little better. 
Let's see if we have working sound. We do indeed. All right, so there we go. It's hooked up through RF. The color doesn't look super great, but I guess uh, we're looking at RF and who knows the RF modulator in this thing may not be particularly good. Let's see if we change the channel to something else and back. There it is BG, it's running in PAL. Um, it picks up my transmitter over there <laughs> on NTSC. It's like totally a multi-capable receiver now. <laughs> so that is really cool as well. We're back on the ZIF64 through composite video. Now, if we take the Chroma Luma cable and I plug this into the front input, it just looks terrible and dark. Now, the color fringing is because we're still set to composite mode. If I switch this to S video and I don't have the Chroma connected, there's a black and white signal. But why is it so dim? I wonder if there's some kind of an issue here with my little RF modulator board. I'm poking it, nothing is changing. We have a control here for Y. Let's see if I can turn this and make the picture any brighter. It does seem to be getting brighter. Oh yeah, that is now much, much brighter. But the problem is, is the composite video output on this thing was never that dim, but the S video was. And I fear if we take this Luma connection out and I plug back in the regular composite, it'll be too bright. No, you know what? That doesn't seem too bright. That seems fine. Yeah, no, that, that seems fine. I mean, the color saturation is really high because I have it in that vivid mode. Uh, they're standard. Okay, I guess I just had that control too low. Okay, so Chroma Luma cable is connected again. Let's switch this over to S-Video. And yeah, okay, now that looks freaking fantastic. I, this, this control was just really, really low. I, I must have done that at some point and then forgotten about it. There, I set this back to standard. It doesn't look so oversaturated. That looks freaking fantastic. So sharp, so clear, so awesome. And of course, now that we're back on the machine with the Kawari, look how the text looks really sharp and great here. We can switch to PAL on the fly. So I just switched the mode there, power cycle the computer, and now we're in PAL. And look, the image even shifts over uh, just like it was doing on the other real one. Uh, sorry for the rolling bars, by the way. All right, I think I'm gonna end this video here. I have been working on this monitor forever. <laughs> it's just been taking quite a long time to get to this point, but I am super happy. I'm also pretty sure that once I edit this video together, it's gonna take quite a while for you to watch it as well. So I hope I didn't lose all my viewers by this outro. I gotta say, uh, this is a box from the board that's in here, this brand new Chinese television board. I am just so impressed with this board. It is so cheap and low cost and like so many corners were cut and yet yeah, it still works as well as it does. And man, am I happy with it in the 1702 versus that Magnavox TV that I had it in. I just hated the way that stupid TV looked. It was all bulbous and round and ugly. This thing on the other hand, it's a looker. I love this monitor already. And now it, this one especially, is so great with its dark phosphor CRT, its multi-format support, and its tuner even. And yet it has stealthy good looks where only eagle-eyed people will be able to spot the differences on this thing unless you of course open the door. And yet this is more capable than pretty much any other 1702 out there on the planet. So I hope this video inspired you to work on your CRTs and keep them living. One old tired 1702 plus a trash found junk television set with a good CRT and one of these ports from China all combined to make one really impressive and good looking monitor. The last thing I wanna add is I'm really hoping there are gonna be a whole ton of angry comments in the comment section saying that I ruined this monitor and it's never gonna work properly again because it's got this cheap junk board in there and all that kind of stuff. I don't want anyone to worry. Over the years of me collecting monitors, I have an entire unmolested, unmodified 1702 chassis, the whole part that slides into this monitor. That was saved from a monitor that was dropped and the whole case was destroyed and the CRT was bad on it as well. I ended up getting rid of all the broken parts and I just kept the guts and I still have that. So if I wanna return this monitor back to 100% stock, all I need to do is slide the guts out and put in the original one that I've been saving, and this monitor is right back to where it was before I started this. Oh, and I just realized there's actually one more thing I wanna mention. A friend of mine, Sark, he bought one of these Chinese boards as well when I got this one, and he had this old 19-inch RCA color television, wood grain and all, that had been left out in the rain. The CRT was still good, but 
all of the electronics were completely ruined in there. He shoehorned this into that and it worked perfectly as well. So I think on the box here, or maybe on the listing for this thing, it says that it works for 14 through 19 inch TVs. Well, he put it in a 19 inch and it worked perfectly. Bright, vibrant image. And he actually also got S-Video working on his and the component input as well. So I can confirm the component does actually work on this based on the work that Sark did. Sark recommends that I should pick up one of those RGB to component adapters and integrate that directly inside of this monitor and then put maybe a DE9 connector on the back. That would give this monitor full RGB capability as well as S-Video and composite and a tuner. So it would really make this thing extra great. Personally, I'm not super concerned about having a monitor that supports RGB because I already have Commodore 1084s that I use regularly. And if I need RGB, I just grab one of those. But that is a nice option to know that the component does work on this thing using those three extra pins on the jungle IC and one of those inexpensive like 30-ish dollar RGB to component adapters works perfectly. Okay, I think I'm finally done blabbering on about this. I love CRTs. I love this whole project that I did here. I am super stoked about this. You'll be seeing this monitor in future videos, I'm sure. I'm gonna keep this one handy along with my 1084. So anytime I need to view a PAL video signal or a PAL RF signal, I can just grab my modified 1702. If you liked this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. They get early access to videos and other cool behind the scenes stuff. And I think I'm finally done talking. I'm almost losing my voice here. So thank you very much for watching. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye. Just a quick addendum at the end of this video. I wanted to let everyone know that I've been using this monitor for a good while after finishing up the project and it works really well. I have it hooked up to an Apple II Plus clone, the one I worked on the channel, and it actually handles Apple II Plus video amazingly well. There is one curiosity though that I have noticed about this TV that I've never actually seen before, but I don't really have a lot of experience with PAL televisions. There's a phenomenon with a PAL television signal called Hanover bars, and it has to do with the phase error of the color information on the alternating lines. The phase errors manifest themselves in something called Hanover bars, which you can see here in these solid colors and also on these colors on the side. There's actually a special circuit in the television to average the color information between two alternating lines to average out this phenomenon. The Wikipedia article actually has a demonstration to show you what that looks like after the averaging, and this is exactly what it looks like. So it, those bars are gone. Now, what's funny is I've run into this particular problem before while trying to use my PAL computers like the Commodore 64 on some of my monitors that support PAL, specifically my Sony and my Panasonic broadcast monitors. They don't have the delay line circuit that it's talking about in this article to cancel out that phenomenon. So any signals that come from my 8-bit computer seem to have really obvious and ugly lines. It looks like here it talks about the fact that PAL later on incorporated some techniques to eliminate these lines and negate the need for this particular circuit. But it seems like all consumer PAL televisions have that delay line circuit in it mentioned here just to eliminate this problem with older devices like the Commodore 64. Now that brings me to the Chinese board that's in this Commodore 1702 now. It seems that it has that color averaging enabled even for NTSC, which is completely unnecessary. And I actually started noticing it when looking at some Apple II graphics. This is a picture of the screen from my Apple II Plus, the clone machine. And the Apple II only has four primary colors besides white and black. It has orange, which is right here, has a blue color, it has purple and it has green. It does not have a brown. It does not have this like pinky color. And strangely enough, it does not have like a light green color either. What's happening is this monitor is applying that delay line averaging that is necessary for PAL handover bars on NTSC. On a normal NTSC monitor that does not have this averaging, which is basically 100% of standard NTSC monitors, you would just see alternating orange and green lines in this brown and over here, I think you're gonna see alternating orange and blue. And you can see a little bit of that showing through right on the edge here. There's a, a purple line there, and then there's an orange line there, and there's a green line there and an orange line there. And even down here, you can see it as well. This should be white and green, white and green. And notice how it's dark green, light green, because it's mixing the green color information with the white line, giving this strange light green color. 
It's happening down here on the rainbow zone as well. That top line has like a light green color going on. None of that should be happening. And I guess it's just one of the negatives with using this TV, which was obviously primarily designed to be a PAL set. And it has these weird things happening on NTSC. Same thing happening here. There's that weird pink color. That's a combination of the orange and the blue. And then there's this sort of gray color here, which I'm not even sure exactly what colors make this up. Probably the blue and the green, when you mix those together, you get this gray color. Now, don't get me wrong, it's generally not a huge problem, and I just noticed this because I'm kind of like a pixel peeper, and most Apple II graphics look completely normal. And when you're watching a standard video signal as well, you can kind of see some slight effects of this if you know what to look for. Uh, you can kind of see it specifically, if I zoom in here, right around the top edges here. You see that going on there? And you can see here how some of the chroma is in the white there. It's like a blue color or a green color. That again is that delay line that's happening. And remember, <laughs> everyone says that PAL is like the best system and NTSC is crap. Well, this delay line thing in this half resolution for chroma is necessary to get a good color, solid color image on PAL and is totally not necessary on NTSC. Now, it'd be really nice if this Chinese board just disabled that chroma filtering on NTSC because it's completely unnecessary but it doesn't, so you get these artifacts around the edges. And I guess, you know, you get these extra colors, which you wouldn't otherwise normally have. So, you know, maybe that's a benefit. I don't know.